Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Gitin, Dafhe, Shavua Tov to everyone, Chodesh Tov. Today's stuff is sponsored by Ruth and Stuart Polchowski in loving memory of Rabbi Dove Greenstone. Today's stuff is sponsored by Leslie glassberg Nadel in loving memory of her mother, Teresa Glassberg, Tova Bat Svi Hirsch and Bela on her 19th year at site. May her name be for a blessing. Okay, we're going to get started with our daf, with going back to the very end of the daf. So quick, short review. We saw this issue of the... Rabbah and Rava, we've been talking about this since the beginning of the Masechet. We have that a person brings a uh, get need, as a messenger from abroad to Israel, needs to say, Before me it was written, before me it was signed. Machlok at Rabbah and Rava, whether the issue is we need to make sure that it was written Lishma, as people that weren't so careful about that halacha either didn't know it or weren't care, didn't want to accept it, didn't accept it as a basic um, halacha, or is it because we're worried that we're not going to have witnesses to verify, we're not going to be able to verify the witnesses on the document, and therefore it's a problem. To which we finally got to this very um, shocking line, the very end of the DAF yesterday, which was, by the way, after getting into some questions, but it seems really the issue is the signatures. Well, even Rabbi, who thought the whole issue was Lishma, actually also thinks it's because of the signatures. And it's really both. So then we started asking questions. We're now going to have three questions on Rabba's approach. Okay, not because he specifically holds like Rabba. No, really on the issue of Lishma. So it's none. We start from four lines from the bottom of Daftalid. This is a Mishnah that appears on Daftet. Okay, so the Mishnah says, Hamivi get me medinat hayam no yachol omal If you have a witness who cannot say, the words, but finally next time, finally next time, we're going to have to figure out why can't the person say it. So what do we do? Well, if there's witnesses, we try to verify the veracity of the witnesses. We already said that's the whole problem. We might not be able to. Well, if you can't, we're going to be stuck. But if you have no choice because the witness can't say it, so go try to search, see if there's somebody who recognizes these witnesses' signatures, see if there's some way you could do it. And if so, the get is a good get. Well, even without going on right now, which the Gemara is going to go on and bring up the Gemara that is going to come up on the Mishnah on Daftet, it's kind of like a copy and paste. We're going to see the exact sugya that appears there. They're going to copy it into here, which is going to explain what does this mean, I know Yachol. But even without that, we already see what the problem is. If you're going to say, check that the signatures are valid signatures. So if I'm signed on there, you know, someone has to check, do, do we recognize my signature? Is that exactly the same signature? Again, I'm a, I'm a woman, but let's assume... I was a man then, right? And men's signatures are the ones who were accepted. So we would check the signature. Does this work? Is this really the person's signature? And that's enough. But that doesn't tell you that it was written and signed Lishma. It doesn't help you just because it matches their signature. It doesn't mean that it was written Lishma. So the Havinaba. So that's going to be the question on Rabbah. But we're going to get there soon. First, we're going to say the Havinaba. And they ask the following question. What is this case of the person can't say? What do you mean they can't say? So first of all, the simple reading is they just weren't there to see and they can't say because of that. That's the simple reading, but that's not the reading the Gemara is going to go with. The Gemara says it must be someone who actually can't speak. So now what are people who can't speak? Well, if you're talking about a deaf mute, okay, the race translates literally to deaf, but in this context, we're talking about a deaf mute. There's a difference in halacha between a person who's deaf and a person who's a deaf mute. So if it's a deaf mute, they're considered a person who doesn't have dot. Okay, they don't have knowledge, which means they're not accepted in all sorts of, they can't do certain halachic things. And one of them is bringing a get, as we're going to see right now. So if you're going to say the person was a deaf mute, well, a deaf mute can't possibly be the messenger to bring the get. Why is that? Because Hatznan, it says in a Mishnah, explicit Mishnah, that they can't. Hakok sherim aviyat get. Everyone can bring a get except for a deaf mute, a shoten, a katan. A shoten is someone with, with um, limited intellectual capabilities and a katan is a minor. So all those people can't bring, so it can't possibly be someone who can't say it because they can't speak because they're a deaf mute. So who could it be? In the end, they're going to say it is a deaf mute, but what's the case? This is one of those creative Gemara answers. It's a case where the person wasn't a deaf mute at the time that he gave the get to the woman. The low he speak Lomar, he was about to say the words, 
and Ajanit Karesh. And exactly at that moment, the person became a deaf mute and they couldn't speak. That's what we mean in Oyachol. It has to be somebody who was capable of bringing the get, but then before they said the statement, so the get was given totally fine by someone who was capable, but they became incapable as soon as they gave the get. So, now again, like I said, we didn't need this section yet. We're going to need it for in a minute from now, but we didn't need it yet because in any case, the Gemara, the Mishnah created a problem to Rabbah. Because Rabbah said the issue was Lishma, and just because if this person didn't say it was written in sign Lishma, and we found the signatures and we can validate the signatures, that still doesn't help you with was it signed and was it written Lishma for the name of this man and this woman. So how do we explain this? To which the Gemara also throws a big thing at us. I've already yesterday, Rabbah was very shocking. What do you mean Rabbah agrees with Rabbah after this whole establishment? He holds this, he holds that, all of a sudden, oh, he actually agrees that you need both. Well, this is also another shocking one, although I did mention it when we learned, or I mentioned it on, I think, on Daf Bed. What's the case? Oh, it's after they already learned the halacha of lishma, which we explained both according to Rashi and Tosfot, according to Rashi, it means they didn't know the drasha before people abroad. And then at a certain point, they became knowledgeable and they knew the drasha. Tosfot, who remember, if you, raise, if you remember, raised the question of, Understand, they only didn't know Lishma, but all the other halachot of get they knew. To which Tosa says, it's that they didn't accept the drasha of Lishma. They didn't think it was an important one. They didn't accept the, say, la means Lishma. But at a certain point in history, before this mission was written, it would have to be, they actually learned, all the people abroad accepted this drasha. So either they didn't know it and they learned it, according to Rashi, or they knew it but didn't accept it. And then at a certain point, they all accepted it as important. Okay, so now the obvious question is, well, if everybody knows that it's Lishma, then why do you need it at all, right? So, then why is it only someone who can't say the words, it should be anyone, even if you could have said and you didn't, according to Rabbah, right? If the issue is Lishma, you don't need that anymore. And if the issue is Edim, so go find Edim and you can verify it based on that. So why is this Mishnah only said about someone who can't say it? Which the Gemara answers, we're going to have a lot of back and forth here. And we're going to actually have a whole repeat because the next question, we're going to have three questions against Rabbah. And all three questions are going to have a very similar structure of answering them. The third one's going to differ a little bit, but for the most part, they're very similar. So What's the concern? We're worried that maybe at some point down the future, the people of Rav will stop keeping this halacha. This sounds very similar to two-day yantif, right? I keep two days of Chag outside of Israel. Why? We know the calendar at this point, but maybe we'll forget the calendar, right? And we won't be able to, right? And then the people of Rav won't know what day it is. Apropos Rosh Chodesh today, right? They won't know it's Rosh Chodesh and maybe there'll be a problem, right? Obviously nowadays it's hard to imagine there'll ever be a problem like that. But that's what the, you know, that's what they determined in the Gemara. We're going to keep it because maybe there will come a time and they'll, they won't have, you know, we'll lose the calendar. So now they say, Xera, we're worried that maybe they'll go back to a state of that. And therefore, now we've moved the whole thing instead of being this Doraita Halacha that we need to ensure that it was done properly on a Torah level, that it was written in sign the Shema. We actually know that it was written in sign the Shema, but we're going to insist, now we're going to only, right, we're going to insist that the Shaliach who brings it says it anyway because of a rabbinic ordinance. So now the Gemara says, well, if there's this rabbinic ordinance that every get has to be said, the messenger has to say it. Well, then go back to where we were. Well, then why is it okay if this person can't say the words, how do we validate the get? If there's a rabbinic ordinance that every get has to be given with the words to say it's lish, it was done lishma, just in case we go back to some time in the future that it's going to be an issue. Well, what are we supposed to do now? Because why would Eino Yachol be okay? It really shouldn't be okay to, because of the rabbinic ordinance to which they answer. Uh, an answer that they kind of take from laws in general of rabbinic ordinances, which is It's a very rare case, okay? They're admitting that this case that they came up with, I think you can almost say they concocted, right? That exactly at that moment, the person became a deaf mute 
in between the time of the giving of the get and the saying the phenomenon time, phenomenon time is an incredibly rare case. So what? Well, there's a concept when it comes to rabbinic ordinances that they're only meant for regular situations. When there's a case that's a rare occurrence, something that's very uncommon, the rabbis didn't make an ordinance for uncommon cases. So that's why this finally explains everything we said now. So let's go back and explain according to this answer. That means that if someone can't say because they were a the calf, they were fine when they gave the gap, but they became immediately deaf mute at that moment and can't say the fanana of tam, there's no rabbinic ordinance there. There's no reason to say fanana of tam. The only issue is that aiding, you need to make sure we verify the aiding, the witnesses. So if you can verify the witnesses, we're good because we've neutralized the issue of lishma. In a regular case, why do you still need to say it? If you can, again, if you can deal with the ADIM and you have witnesses who can verify the signatures, why do you still need according to Rabbi? Because even though now they keep the Salah of Lishma, we might in the future end up with a play, uh, be in a time where people abroad don't keep the Halach of Lishma, and therefore we're going to require this as a, a basic requirement. But now the Gemara is going to have a question on the last line we just said. We said in rare occurrences, you don't need to say for the issue of lishma. To which the Gemara says, well, what's another rare case? If the woman brings her own get, okay, or even any woman is the messenger to bring the get, but the woman bring her own get, we discussed already, and we're going to see the Mishnah about it, that a woman, now what would be the case? We talked about this already. If the husband says to the woman, again, it would be very rare, go bring your get to this court in Israel. And, you know, and when you get there and you kind of, you go to the court and bring your get there, that's when your get will apply. Okay. I'm giving you this get, but it's not really yours yet until you get to Israel and go to this court. And when the woman gets there, according to the Mishnah, she herself can bring her own get. She could be the messenger. She has to say that declaration. Now, why would she have to say that declaration? Isn't this a rare case? And didn't we say it after they already learned and we're only worried, we're worried about it, right? The rabbis made this ordinance, but they only make ordinances in normal cases. And this is not a normal, typical case. So why does she have to do it? The answer is, well, we want to make it that every messenger has to do the same thing. Now, in our case that we quoted, that we started with, he had no choice. He couldn't say it. He became a deaf mute. So we can't require the same thing for everybody here because he can't speak. But in a case of the woman who can speak, she has to say it because if we say she doesn't have to, people might think the next messenger that comes doesn't have to and will create problems. So she has to do it so that we don't distinguish. Well, wait a minute. If we say that we don't distinguish, then... So we keep answering questions and then raising questions on those answers. If that's the case, Baal Nami, what if the husband brings his own get? And we're going to see in a second that a husband who brings his own get doesn't need to say it. Now, if you're going to say, we don't want to distinguish between messengers, then why don't we require that the husband also has to say it? Because if you see the husband bring his own get and he doesn't say, you'll think that the next messenger that comes doesn't have to say it either. So Baal Nami, the husband should also, if you're not distinguishing between messengers, the husband also, now it's a little tricky, he's not exactly a messenger, he is the person, and you'll see that how the Gemara is going to answer it. But Allah Matanya, why does it say in the Brayta, who at Moshe Vigito, ain't sarich lomar b'fanai nechtav, b'fanai nechtav. The Brayta says clearly, if the man brings his own get, he does not need to say b'fanai nechtav, b'fanai nechtav. To which the Gemara answers clearly, well, ta'ama ma'yam or rabbanan sarich lomar b'fanai nechtav, b'fanai nechtav. What is the reason why the husband needs to say this? And we started our Masechah with this. Maybe the husband will come and say, this is a good get. Now, if he himself brings the get and hands it to the woman, if you're no way is he going to come later and say this wasn't a good get when he himself brought the get. Now you have to wonder, and I saw some people were puzzled by this in general, which is if a husband sends a messenger to bring the get, why is he going to later claim that it wasn't a good get? So for that, we can have some obvious reasons. Okay, We're going to see later that when the husband sends a messenger to give the get, and we talked about this, it, the get is not valid until it gets to the woman. Okay, And we're going to see cases where a husband sends a shaviyah, okay, starting in the fourth parrot, 
And he basically catches up to the shaliach and says to the shaliach, listen, I changed my mind. I don't want to give her the get. So the husband, theoretically, right, he knows that until the get gets to the woman, he can change his mind at any time. Now, it's a bit of a problem with this. How's he going to cancel it? What if he can't catch the shaliach? And Rabban Gamliel actually institutes all takana to prevent the husband, because theoretically, we'll get to this later, but the husband can actually go to a court and just say the get that I sent that shaliach with is canceled, even though the get and shaliach doesn't know that, which creates a whole problem. And Rabban Gamliel says, no way can we do this anymore because it's creating issues that the woman thinks she's divorced and she's not. That's a whole other issue we're going to get to. But what it highlights is that when a husband sends a get with a messenger, he knows that it's not a done deal and he can always change his mind. Why would he change his mind? All sorts of reasons. Again, we talked about, you know, there's people who maybe were forced to give the get and the Gemara is going to talk about cases like that too. And where they force the husband and then the husband changes his mind. He says, oh yeah, I'll give the get. And then he doesn't in the end. And unfortunately we see cases like this all the time nowadays. So that could be one possibility or he could just change his mind about it. We know people change their mind about these things. So, you know, as long as he, if he gives the get to her, he knows it's final. He's not going to come and he wouldn't give it to her unless he was sure. But if he gave it to a messenger and then he could theoretically change his mind. And that's why there's a concern that when he gives it to a shalik, he might actually change his mind. And if he changes his mind, but it's too late, he could try all sorts of methods like claim that the get wasn't given lishma or the get was a forged document and all sorts of things. That's what we're concerned about. But we're definitely not concerned about it in the case where the husband brings it himself because there's no way to say he didn't want to give her the get if he actually gave it to her. Why would he give her a document that was a forged document? It makes absolutely no sense. So therefore, okay, so that was all to explain why. If we're going to say the woman is a rare case, so why does she have to do it? So then we're going to say, well, the man, we don't have, right, the woman, it's because we want to just make the same rule for all messengers. But all messengers doesn't include the husband because he's an exception to the rule. Now getting to the second question, and if the whole back and forth wasn't so clear, we're going to review it because this is going to have the same back and forth. Tashma, second source. Okay, I want to point out something about the words Tashma. Tashma means come and learn, and it's an introduction to a source. Now it could be, and here's a good place to show it, it could be a Tanaitic source or it could be uh, an Amora speaking. And we're going to see two Tashmas today. The first one is, is here which is, and also Tashma, by the way, could be an opening to a question. It could be an opening to like a difficulty. It could be an opening to a, to a proof or an answer. In our case, it's going to be a raising of a difficulty. It's going to bring a source from the outside, okay, which means from anywhere. It could be Tan Itik, it could be Amor Itik, as opposed to a word like Metive or Etive, which means we're bringing a question on an Amor from a Tan Itik source. So you know you're having a Tan Itik source. Here you're going to see the first one we're going to quote is actually and Amora speaking. And the second one we're going to quote is Atana speaking. Okay, it's a Sanaitic source. So just to notice how phrases are used in the Gemara, this is just a good place to see how it doesn't tell you exactly what type of source it is by just the words Tashma. What it really means is come and learn, meaning we're taking something and we're pulling it into our sugi. So here we're pulling in. Shmuel asked Rapunda the following question. If two people bring a get from abroad, do they need to say those words? It was written in front of me, it was in front of us, it was signed in front of us, or do they not need to? No, we don't need to say. So now they say, um, now here's his answer. Why What's Why is that the answer? Because if they were to come and testify and say, in front of us, he divorced her, okay, they'd be believed. So therefore, we basically have two witnesses to verify the get, and we're no longer worried that we won't be able to find witnesses. This obviously goes only according to Rava, and not Rava, because this doesn't say anything about Lishma. So Rava Nicha, Rava Kasha. Because just because they could say, we saw he divorced her, doesn't mean that the get was written and signed Lishma. He could have divorced her with the wrong kind of document, you know, with a document he found in the garbage or something. So, again, the Gemara is going to say, what's the case? After they already learned the halakha of Lishma, and therefore we're not really worried. Well, if we're not really worried, you know where this is going. Why only two? Is it okay? Should be even one doesn't need to say anything. So again, answer, we're worried that it might revert back to the old scenario where people weren't 
careful about it. And therefore we're gonna require witnesses to say it in general when one witness comes. So now the obvious is why only one, not two? Betrain Ami. Why wouldn't you require it also for two then? If the issue is Lishma, the two don't help you with that by the fact that there's two of them. Well, again, we're going to answer. Betre de Maite Gita, Milta de Loshricha. It's a very rare case that a husband will send a get with two witnesses, right? He probably, probably has to pay them. It costs money to send the witnesses abroad. It's very unlikely he'll do that. Milta de Loshricha, Lo Gazru Barabanan. When you have a very rare case, the rab rabbinic ordinance does not apply in the rare situation. Beha Isha de Loshricha, but wait. A woman bringing her own get, again, exact repeat. The woman bringing her own get is lo shricha, is very uncommon. Utsnan, and it says in the Mishnah, ha'isha atzma mitiagita, u'bevad shi atzma tzricha lomar, b'fanai nechtav, b'fanai nechtam. She brings her own get as long as she says, b'fanai nechtav, b'fanai nechtam, it's good. Why do we require her? It's a very rare case. We should say, if it's only exera de Rabbanan, we shouldn't need it. Shalot taklof b'shlichut. It's because we don't want to distinguish between messengers. And we require everybody who brings it as long as they're one person. Well, Ihachi, if so, Baal Nami, then the husband also should have to do it if he brings his own get. And Allah Matanya, why does it say in a bride to what's Moshe? It's always great when we have this total chazara in, built into the da'af. So when the husband brings it, he shouldn't need to say it. And it says here that, I'm sorry, he should need to say it. And he actually doesn't need to. To which the Gemara answers, same answer as before. What's the reason? The husband might want to claim that the get was fake, not a real get, and disqualify it. Here he's bringing it in his own hand. There's no way he's going to claim later that it wasn't a good get. That was two questions against Rabba. From the first one was kind of it extorts. The second was Amoraim saying that the first one was when this a person who couldn't say because he came he came a deaf mute right exactly at that moment after giving the get and couldn't say it. Rare case, and that's why. Remember, the whole thing is after they learned. And same thing for this case of two people bringing it, also a very rare case, and therefore there's no need to have the rabbinic ordinance there. And that's why all you have to do is take care of the aid. If you can prove that the people signed on the document are valid, that works. Third source, Tashma, let's learn from here. And here we're going to quote a Tosefta, which is from the Tanaitic time period. And it's like a parallel book to the Mishnah called the Tosefta, put together by Rabbi Chia. Hamevi get me Medina Hayam. Unatznula velo amarla befanai nechtav befanai nechtam. Somebody brings a get from abroad and doesn't say those words. Doesn't say the declaration. It was written in front of me. It was signed in front of me. Again, what does it say? As long as you can validate the signatures, it's fine. But if you can't validate the signatures, it's no good. Again, right? Now, this already, before we continue, this already is a clear indicator, again, that all we care about is the signatures and not about was it written in sign lishma, just validating the signatures, which is only Rava and goes against Rava. But then it continues and it says, The reason why we're not going to disqualify this just because they didn't say it as long as we can validate the signatures is because the whole reason they required was to make her life easier. Remember, what's the reason? We want to protect her from a husband later coming and nullifying her get and claiming, right, it was no good. But not not that we're going to make it worse for her. So basically, as long as we can validate the signatures, it's good. So again, the Rav Anicha, the Rav Akasha, doesn't fit with Rabba, who says the issue is Lishma. You don't see that addressed here at all. To which, again, the Gemara is going to answer. Ha la do. Oh, the case is after they already learned. To which the Gemara says, Oh, but wait. It's true they learned the halacha, but isn't there a rabbinic ordinance that this has to be said? Because otherwise, right, there might come a time in the future when people stop saying it and then people stop keeping this halacha and then we're going to be in trouble. Well, kisheni saint. Ah, we're going to be lenient here because the case is, even though they didn't tell you this before, the case is that the woman already remarried. There's always a difference in halacha. If the woman isn't yet married and she's going to get married, or the woman's already married. What's the problem if the woman's already married? 
first of all, we don't want to require her to get a divorce based on, you know, some concern, possible concern, you know, maybe that's the right of our little girl, what we're going to make her get divorced from her husband. And all the more so, if she has any children with him, they're going to be mamzerim, and we definitely don't want to create extra scenarios of mamzerim. So the Gemara says, wait a minute, if you're saying this case is Bishani safe, where she's all, Kishani safe, she's already remarried, well, then it should have said so in the Tosefta. What did the Tosefta say, right? Ihachi, you should have said there, we only did this to be lenient for her, not to be strict with her when she's already remarried. It didn't say that in the Tosefta. It should have said that in the Tosefta if that's what they meant. To which the Gemara answers, well, that's the way you should read the Tosefta. This is how you should read it. If you think we should be strict with her and what's lafka from the root of nafak, nafak is lahutsi to take her out. If you think we should, that this is a halacha, you must say, and if not, and the woman got remarried based on this get that never had that declaration made, we're going to be strict with her. And in what way are we going to be strict? We're going to make her get divorced from her husband? No. No, this was only meant to be lenient for her to help her out. In what way is it meant to be lenient? Turning now to Amabet, Tamamai, what's the whole reason? And this we just said before, Dilma Ate Ma'ara Upasile, because maybe the husband will come later once she's already remarried and claim that it wasn't a get and she'll have Mamzerim, children that are now going to be called Mamzerim. But Hashtaba Lo Kama'are, but now that she's remarried already and the husband didn't come to complain and we just realized that the get was given without the declaration but we're going to go and now be strict with this woman and say you have to get divorced and your children are mamzerim no way no how are we going to do that but again this is only if she's already remarried okay and that resolves our issue so we have which means ideally really we do need lishma because shema yachzorah devar lekokulo but we're not going to require it in the case where the woman already remarried because we're not going to go that far and make it worse for her when the husband didn't even try to do that. Okay, so what we did so far, three questions, two, one from a Mishnah, one from a Tosefta, two from Tana Inic sources, the middle one from Emoraim, from what Rav Huna said, and we resolved them all basically in the same kind of way, which was to neutralize somewhat the issue of or, or um, water down the issue of Lishma. To so basically say it's only really a rabbinic ordinance. And once you get to the rabbinic ordinance, we can be lenient in all sorts of cases, either in a rare situation, which was the first two, or in a case where the woman's already remarried so as to avoid mamzerim issues. Now we find out that this machloka, Rabbi and Rava, let's just talk about who Rabbi and Rava were. Rabbi is a third generation Emora, and Rava was a fourth generation Emora. This machloka is bipluted to Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is the exact same machloket that you see in an earlier generation, Rabbi Shoban Levi's first generation, Rabbi Yochanan first slash second generation, there's a bit of a debate exactly when, but he's beginning of the Amoraim time period in Israel. Two Amoraim in Israel have the exact same debate. We don't know who says what yet. One said because of the Shema issue, the other one said it's because we don't have witnesses, to right? They're not going to be around to find. To stayin, to stayin is a word that's used when we have one of these hadamal, hadamal, one said this, one said that, and we want to identify who said what. Sometimes we just have it, this one said that, this one says that, we never really know. But often the Gemara says to stayin, which means we can conclude, what it really means, we can conclude that this is the one who says this, and then obviously by process of elimination, the other one says the other opinion. And that's because we have some other source that can clarify this. De Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, so tistayim de Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, hu de amar l'fisha en b'ki'in l'shma. We can conclude that Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is the one who says b'ki'in l'shma, that that's the issue like Rabbah. De Rabbi Shema bar Abba, ay te gita l'kamei de Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Rabbi Shema bar Abba brought a get in front of him. He was a messenger. He brought the get to Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Va'amar lehi. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Abba says, or asks really, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, do I need to tell you it was written in front of me, it was signed in front of me, or not? He says, no, you don't need to. Why not? That was only in the earlier generations when they didn't know this halacha. But in later generations where you 
don't need lishma anymore because people know it already. You don't need to say. It. This is going to obviously raise some questions. You're probably thinking about them. But in any case, before we get to those questions, it's time. From here, it's clear that the issue for Yeshua and Levi is the Lishmaj. So now the Gemara says, Number one, Rabbah agrees with Rava, if you remember, and we were stuck, we had to say that because of a Tanitic source, which would then mean that Rabbi Shoban Levi would also have to say this, that it's both issues, not just Lishma, it's also Edim Mitzuyim. So why didn't he require him to say it for that? And furthermore, even if it's the Lishma issue only, we already said in an ideal case, right, in a regular typical case, you have to say it. And this looks like a very typical case. Rabbi Shimon Bar Abba brought a get. He was one person. Why wouldn't he need to say it? To which the Gemara answers. We're going to have an answer that basically answers both questions in one shot. Rabbi Shimon Bar Abba inish achrina hava bahade. It was him and somebody else. Why didn't the story mention this? Well, Mishum Fodo de Rabbi Shimon. He was the important one. So when he came and they both brought the get, he came forward, asked the question, and he got the answer. But obviously, he was with somebody else. Why is it so obvious? Because it makes no sense. That Rabbi Sh- based on everything we learned, it makes absolutely no sense. That Rabbi Shobo and Levi would say, one person wouldn't need to bring it. It must have been two. And then that resolves the Adim issue, and that resolves the Lishma issue. Because, because of the Xerah de Rabbanan, we don't make it in a rare case where two people bring it. We already learned. So again, after bringing three questions against Rabbah, we now bring a machlok at Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi and Rabbi Yochanan, say that that machlok is the exact same machlok as Rabbah and Rabbah. We then bring a story to basically figure out who says what. We now conclude Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says Lishma, Rabbi Yochanan says Edi Mitzuyim Makaimo, process of elimination. And we resolve the issue of this story that made no sense by saying it must have been he had somebody else with him and they just didn't bother mentioning because he was such a great person that the second person was kind of you know, not important compared to him and didn't require mention. Now we we'll bring up another machloket and soon we're going to try to connect this machloket. Itmar, bifne, I mean, that's connected to the lishma and edi mitsuyim issue. Bifne kama notes no. Itmar is usually an introduction to a, to an amore, a debate between amoraim. And the debate is when you bring the get, and we made mention of this before, in front of how many people do you need to say the word, words, bifanai neftav u bifanai neftav. Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Hanina. So the two of them debate. And again, we don't know who says what. And again, we're going to have it to time and figure out who says what. Chad Amar so notice already here, Rabbi Yochanan appears here and Rabbi Yochanan appears in the previous debate. So if we're going to try to connect these two machlokot, Rabbi Yochanan is going to have to match up. So just remember in your head that Rabbi Yochanan said, Ein edimitsuim l'kaimo. For him, the issue is that we need witnesses to verify the signature. So now, Rabbi Yochan, Rabbi Hanina, Chan Amal B'fnei Shnaim, Chan Amal B'fnei Shlosha. One set in front of two, one set in front of three. Now, when you hear the words two and three, and we're going to see this in Gitin in a bunch of places, two always means you need witnesses, because two is witnesses. We've learned that already in Sota, remember? Usually it's two witnesses, sometimes it's one. We learned it on the first half of Gitin also. But if you say three, it means you need a court, because three is court, because courts are three people. So now, the minimum court anyway is three people. Why is it makes sense that Rabbi Yochanan is the one who says in front of two? Because again, we're going to have a story with Rabbi Yochanan. So Rabbi, the son of Rabbi Chista, brings a get before Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says to him, sorry, give it to her in front of two witnesses. And say to them, So he basically says, when you want to give the wife, the woman the get, bring it in front of two witnesses. Seems clear, two. You don't need more than two. He doesn't say witnesses. He just says two. It's obvious then he holds two. So now, Tistayin. From there, you can infer he says two. Now here comes the problem because, remember, he says it's Aiden. Why don't we suggest that the machloket is based on the same machloket of Aiden Mitsuyim or Lishma? What's the purpose of these witnesses and this declaration? Well, demanda amar b'fnei shnayim kasavar lepisha in b'kiin lishma. The one who says you need to do it in front of two, basically all you need is in front of witnesses, because in the end, what do you need? You need testimony that this is was done properly. Now, the one witness isn't enough. It's enough for him to bring it and say it. But if we want to establish it down the road, he has to have said it in front of two witnesses so that there's witnesses to the fact that it was done lishma. Umanda amar b'fnei shlosha. 
You say in front of three, why? Because what are you doing basically? You're doing what we call kiyum shtarot. What's kiyum shtarot? When you ratify a document, you say the signatures on this document are valid. In front of who do you do that in general? You do it in a court. So you need three people. There's no reason to require three people if the issue is lishma. So the one who says two is because of lishma. The one who says three is because of Eidim Mitsuyim. Now, who said two? Rabbi Yochanan. What did Rabbi Yochanan say in the previous machloket? Eidim Mitsuyim Mekayma. So that doesn't make any sense. Which is what the Gemara is going to say. The Tizbara, do you really think that's the case? We already established Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is the one who said in the previous machloket that it's Biki and Lishma is the issue, which would then mean that Rabbi Yochanan Amar Lefisha Eni Dimitsuyim Lakaimo. And here Rabbi Yochanan, we just said, said you only need two. Number one question, it's going to be just like before, we have two questions. Number one question is if he thinks it's Eni Dimitsuyim Lakaimo, how can we possibly say it's enough to do it in front of two? You need a court. The odd, and furthermore, Rabbi Ile de Rava, the one who says the one who says Lishma, also thinks you need to ratify the document. So everyone should require three. So that can't be the machlo. Ella de Kule Alma be in an So everybody obviously needs a dimitsum makaimo, which means you need kim shtarot, which means you need a court. So how do we have this machlo at two or three? The hacha bashalech nasa eid ve eid nasa dayan kamifta. The next suggestion is. That the machloket is, can the shaliach function as an aid? Yes, of course. The shaliach can be a witness. That we've established from the very beginning. The shaliach is functioning both as a messenger to bring the get and as a witness to testify about the contents of the get. But could he also count as a dayan? Can he play both sides? Because in the end, you, I don't know if you were thinking about this before, but it's not like there's two now that are that are there to verify the signatures. There's three because you have the person who's testifying about in the first place and he testifies between two people, in front of two people. So altogether, you have three people now who can say these are valid signatures. So the machloket is, right, Mandamar Bifneshnaim, the one who holds in front of two, holds that. And this is a debate again in other places. Shaliach nasa aid. A shaliach can become a witness, and aid nasa dayan, and the witness can become a dayan. It's actually interesting we're learning this on Rosh Chodesh because they talk about this in Rosh Chodesh. What if the judges were the ones who saw the new moon? Can they function as witnesses and judges at the same time? Umanda, so the one who says in front of two, it's enough to have two because the witness can function as a judge. So the witness, the shaliach, the messenger can be a witness, but but a witness can't be a judge at the same time. No, judges, witnesses, they stand distinct, which would mean you'd need three. But there's a problem with this also. Why? But we, everyone agrees when it comes to rabbinic issues, okay, as opposed to let's say Kiddush HaChodesh making, determining the new moon where it's a, a Doraita issue and there, there's a machloket about it. But when it comes to a Durabanan issue, and this is all Durabanan, if it's Lishma, we already said, right, it's only Shema Yachzor Adavar Kula. If it's Eni Dimitsu Makaimo, which is really what we're saying now is our, is our focus right now, if it's the witnesses, we already said that Rishla Kish says, as soon as you have witnesses signed on a document, it's as if it was verified in the court. And it's only that the rabbis required this as an extra safeguard, but it's all rabbinic. And in rabbinic issues, for sure, the witness can function as a judge. So you really only need two. So now we have to explain why do you need three, according to that opinion. Since a woman can bring the get, and what would happen in the case of a woman? You might have the woman come, right? Now, if in general, all you have to do it is in front of two, then when the woman comes to do it, you'll assume she could do it in front of two people. But a woman can't be a judge. So if a woman can't be a judge, how can we allow her, right? We, if she does it in front of two, it actually won't work. So therefore, we always require in front of three so that you don't end up in a situation where the woman brings again and it ends up in front of two. So that's the first opinion. So what about the person who says two? The second opinion who says it's enough to do it in front of two says, because everyone knows a woman can't be a judge. Since everyone knows a woman can't be a judge, there's no concern that they'll think that it's okay to do it in front of two when the woman's there. When the woman's there, they'll bring three. On a regular case, they'll bring two, and everyone knows to make that distinction. Now, it's interesting whether, it, it, will everyone know that there's a distinction? You also could say, does everyone know that the two are really three, 
You know, maybe they won't understand the issue that you need a court and that's not a court. It's a good question. By the way, just about the issue of women judges, it seems very clear from the sugya that women cannot be judges. However, the Sefer Achinuch quotes an opinion in the mitzvah limanot to, to appoint judges. The Sefer Achinuch basically brings an opinion based on Devorah was a shofetet and she was a judge. And he based in this in the book of Shoftim, book of judges. And he basically says that there's an opinion that holds that a woman actually could be a judge, which is interesting. She can't be a witness, but she could be a judge. And, and there is this opinion that women can be judges. And anyway, it's a big, and most people don't agree with him, but he does mention opinions that say this, and it's an interesting sugya to look into. Anyway, back to our guy. So we explained, just to review, we tried to explain this machloket two and three. Does it have to do with the machloket of lishmar edim etzuyim l'kaimo? We basically proved it can't because Rabbi Yochanan doesn't match up. So we've rejected that. We said it has to do with this issue of aid nasa dayan, could a witness become a judge, function also as a judge or not? But then we said, actually, theoretically, it really would work. It's just because there's women who could do this. Therefore, there's concern, possibly, that's the machloket. Is there a concern people will then think with men, with, with the woman, it's enough to do it in front of two, or will they realize that distinction? And therefore, in general, you could do it with two. If the woman were to come, you'd obviously need three. Or do we say, let's just do three in all cases. This is, again, the same idea like lo tachlok, let's not make distinctions so that people don't get confused, et cetera. Okay, that's that section. Now we're going to move on and bring a brighter like Rabbi Yochanan that needs to be done only in front of two. Tanya kavate de Rabbi Yochanan. What if you bring a get and you didn't say the words According to Rabbi Meir, we're going to see a very strict opinion. Even if she's married, this goes against what we saw before, because this is Rabbi Meir's opinion. Even if she's married, you have to make her get divorced. And if she has a child, the Vlad is a mom's here because this get wasn't given properly. That's the very Rabbi Meir. Right now, just remember, we're trying to bring this to prove it has to be done in front of two. We haven't seen that yet. Rabbi say, the child is not a mom's here. We are not, uh, not that strict. So Ketzad Yase, how do you rectify the situation? Yitzlena himeno, so the 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 shaliach will re take the get back from her. The yachzor of yitnen alav b'fnei shnayim, he'll redo it now in front of two. The yomal b'fanai nechtam, b'fanai nechtam. So now, what do you see here? The main part we brought this was it says in front of two people. He goes in front of two people, and then he says the declaration. The assumption, I guess, here is that he forgot to say it or something like that. So now he would just have to redo it. He would kind of re-give the woman the get, and it would be retroactively valid from before, so her children are not mamzei. Now, because they brought this up, this was just to prove Rabbi Yochanan, but now they want to basically say that Rabbi Meir, how could he possibly say this? Mishum delo amar mamzeo. Really? We're going to make mamzeo out of this? We already discussed. We're not going to do that kind of thing. So in Rabbi Meir, the time, yeah, in fact, Rabbi Meir goes, he's consistent with his opinion. Rabbi Nuna says in the name of Ula, Omer haya Rabbi Meir, they quote Rabbi Meir saying, he was very strict. And he said, listen, if the rabbis say, this is how the get has to be, this is how the get has to be. Anyone who changes, the get is not a get. He obviously was trying to instill in people the importance of doing the get in the proper manner and therefore said, if you change anything, it's going to be invalid. Okay, the last part for today now is to get to what of the, of the writing of the get has to be known that it was done lishma. So when you're the witness that says, it was written lishma, what of the writing of the get do you have to see? And we're going to see an interesting story we're going to start with. Bar Hadaya, Baili to Yagita, he wanted to bring a get. So he goes to Rabbi Acha, who was the guy in charge of gets in his town. And Amr Lei, Sarichat, so he asked him, what do I have to do? Amr Lei, you have to know that every single letter written in that get was written lishma. He didn't like his answer. So after the command, Rabbi Ami for Rabbi Asi, he goes in front of Rabbi Ami, Rabbi Asi. Big question: How can he do that? Right? You usually ask question for Rabbi. You can't just go and shop around. But anyway, he goes to them. I'm really lotsricha. No, you don't need it. And the commentaries say all you need is just one line. You have to know one line is written the Shema. That's enough. The chitema yavid lechumra. And here they say, here's the big line for today. And if you say it was, you know, let's be strict about it and make sure to see every letter. This is a fascinating line. This means that now if you're strict, you're going to make everybody say whatever was done before that was lenient is no good. So don't be strict because it'll cause people to basically 
give a bad name to all the ones that were done earlier. And then people can say, oh, these women aren't divorced. You have to be very careful when you're going to be machmir because it makes people look askance when they look at older things that weren't done in that way. Very important lesson. Rabbi Barbarchana Aitagita. So he brought a get. Palgi katab kameu, palgaloi katab kameu. Part was written in front of him, part wasn't. This shows you don't need the whole thing to be written lishma. And you know, you don't need to know that the whole thing was written lishma as a witness. And last thing, Atal Kameh de Rabbi Elazar, when he got in front of Rabbi Elazar, Amarle, Afilu lo katabo ela shita kalishma shuve no One line is sufficient. Tomorrow we'll see another opinion about this, and then we'll finish up this section. So what we saw today very quickly, three sugi, right? We have three basic sugiyo. One was Three questions on Rabbah from different sources, which we will solve. Number two, we have the Machloka, Rabbi Yochanan, and, uh, sorry, four sections. Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, same Machloka as Rabbah and Rava. Then we jump to the Machloka, Bifne Kama Kotvo, Bifne Kama Notno, how many people do you have to give it? Two or three. We have three options till we finally got to the third to really explain what the root of the debate between the two and the three is. And then we had this last issue of how much of it has to be, does the witness need to see, the messenger need to see that it was written Lishma? before he could come and say the word and we saw a bunch of different answers and we'll see even more tomorrow. Wishing everyone a good day, a good week, and a good month. Bye.